Deceptive lies are going out. <clears throat> as, as you probably know, Obama <clears throat> has openly said that the Crusades are, uh, or the Christian Crusade was just as bad as what ISIS is doing today uh, to the world. And I'm just thinking, this is an educated man, a lawyer, who, who's gone to universities and has studied history and so forth, and uh, some profess that he may not be Christian and he's actually Muslim. I don't know what the truth is there. You can only guess. But without, <clears throat> without understanding the history, uh, you can't make that contrast at all. I mean, it's ridiculous. And then Brian, the newscaster, finding out all these lies now that are coming out from him, from the news. It is a struggle to, to know what is true. What are people saying and can I even believe them? And that's why I love the scriptures, because we can simply believe the word of God. It has been written uh, by 66 different authors throughout the various periods of time. It has not been tainted or touched. We have documents uh, going back as, as early as uh, 99 uh, A.D., uh, showing that there's no changes in those documents. We have even extra documents like the Dead Sea Scrolls that... that, that validify the documents that we have in the in, in the Greek and in the Hebrew uh, language. Um, you have the Old Testament, uh, you have historical, you have artifacts that uh, we find and continue to find, proving that these documents are true. And of course, uh, it really lies on who you're going to believe. Are you going to read it for yourself or are you going to believe some guy that's reading it for you and, and, and put all of your life in his hands? That's really the question. There are really two points in the life of Christ that we find most important. The, the, the first point is his birth, right? It has to be important. Christ has to be born. The second point is his resurrection, right? Without the resurrection, there is no gospel. There is no eternal life. There is no hope. We just all die, and that's it. Life is, is over. So two very important points when it comes to Christianity, his birth and his resurrection. Without a birth, there's no Messiah, there's no Christ. And we're looking at his birth. We're focusing on his childhood at this moment. And so the theme, the young child. Uh, we don't hear too much about Christ being a young child. Matthew shares with us here, probably anywhere from six months to two years old. And we'll see in a minute what is going on in his life at that time. We also see uh, the situation where Mary and Joseph take Jesus to the temple to perform uh, the ceremony, being at the age of 12. And we see Jesus talking with some of the scribes there and men in the temples and, and, and really uh, speaking profound words to them. Uh, Joseph and Mary come back and they, they get Jesus and said, where have you been? And of course, Jesus says those words that resonate, I think, in all of our hearts that know Christ. I've been about my father's business, right? Um, <clears throat> words that we should all be able to say too. If someone were to say, well, what have you been doing with your life? Well, I've been about my father's business, looking for opportunities to share the gospel, looking for opportunities to be light. Not to be light, but to let him, his light shine through us because we are light, because we are salt. And so we're about our father's business. And so not too much is said about Christ as a young age. We know there's other gospels, they profess them to be other gospels, but they're not canonical. Uh, they're not part of the scriptures like the gospel of Thomas. And they're, they're Gnostic writings, extra writings that, that men have wrote and, and put fairy tales in them uh, that talk about Jesus being a young child and, and, and touching a bird and the bird was dead and all of a sudden it comes alive, you know, those type of things. You can come up with better stories, I think, than that with your own imagination. Uh, what would it have been like for Christ to be, you know, six months old or a year, you know, crawling around. And what was his life? I think he was normal, just like any other child is normal. Uh, two years old, did he go through the terrible twos? You know, was he touching everything? Run, climbing up on things and so forth. You know, I think his life was normal. We can only guess. We really don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us, and so we have to be silent in those areas. And that's what I love about the scriptures, is we can take what it's saying there objectively, uh, knowing that's all it's saying, we can't add to it, we can't delete from it, we just have to receive what's there and what it's saying to us. And so we see in verses 9 through 12, these wise men are directed by a star to Bethlehem, where this young child is. And, and truly we've been 
focusing on worship and worshiping our Savior Jesus Christ. So these wise men are men that that truly do worship God and, and hope to worship Him face to face, right? And that, that's her, their whole objective is to find this young child and to offer Him gifts and to bow before Him and literally worship Him face to face. That must have been an awesome thing for them to finally see Him, their Messiah, the one that the Scriptures spoke about where they learned probably during the time of the captivity in Babylon and Daniel probably starting a school of some sort and teaching them about the Messiah that would come in the future. As Daniel shared about uh, various other things of Jesus' coming and so forth. And finally they're there. Finally they see the star and finally they're going to see their Savior face to face. And that's our hope today, right? Our hope is to live our lives in this journey that we're on the one day that we'll finally see the Messiah face to face. And I know that I'll be on my face for quite a while just worshiping Him because he is so good. So let's read verses 9 through 12. It says, When they heard the king, they departed, and that was King Herod. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasuries, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Now we left off in verses 7 through 8. We saw in verse 7 that Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, he determined from them what time the star had appeared. And so he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully uh, for the young child, and when you have found him, you know, bring back word to me that I may come and, and worship him also. And so Herod trying to, to set a trap uh, for this young child. Herod is the king, and we talked at length last time we met um, of the Jews at this moment, appointed king by the Roman government, and he is a corrupt and, and wicked man, and he will not share his, his throne with anyone, and so in reality, he's looking to kill this young child. And so that's why he's inquiring through them secretly and and very politely and diplomatically with a smile on and everything, you know, and yet in the back of his head saying, when I find him, I'm going to kill him. And that's his whole plan. So they leave Herod and heard what he said, and they departed, and behold, a star, uh, a supernatural light was leading them. Uh, Normally... It's interpreted as a celestial body, which is interesting, and I'll talk about that in a minute. This star, this this thing, this object that was in the sky, in the in the atmosphere, was leading them. Literally, they could literally follow it, and then it hovered over where the young child was at there, and they'd seen it from the east. I've always been amazed at 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 the stars and space it's a pretty amazing thing when you look at what we have seen today the billions and billions of stars now you know as well as i that these models that they show us today of the of the stars and the galaxies and the solar systems you know they're just models right Uh, these are just men's imaginations of what they may look like we really don't know what they look like but it gives us an idea of what they may look like when you see these these um trailers you know like to to spider-man and you see him going through the stars and their circles and galaxies and all these neurons firing and you know just various things like that these are all just man's imagination of what it may look like we really don't know what it looks like we know what our solar system looks like we know we know where our earth and sun and moon and pluto and saturn and all those places are but beyond that you know it's guessing games you know we know there's lights all over the place space you know, space itself is, is pretty amazing. Uh, I was reading an article just the other day that there's clearly no boundary between our space and outer space. There's not like a wall where all of a sudden you hit it and boom, you bust through, in a sense, to the space itself. There's, it's a gradual uh, moving into space. And as you are moving into space, it's getting denser and denser and denser, and then all of a sudden you're in space itself. And in that space, they tell us that sound doesn't exist. 
And so I could be speaking, but you won't hear anything because it, nothing moves. It just floats. And you could touch something that's in space and it will just start to float and it will continue at that speed, just floating around for eternity probably until something else touches it and it moves. So it's silent. <clears throat> it's dense. You can't breathe. There is no oxygen, no sound waves. And so you need those big old helmets that communicate with one another going from satellite to satellite in various uh, areas. And so it's pretty interesting, this star that they seen in the east was a star that had a constant glow. In verse 7, Herod called the Magi secretly, found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. So it appeared all of a sudden. It wasn't, you know there in the morning and just continued on it all of a sudden appeared before them in verse 2 we see where he asked where is the one who has been born king of the jews <clears throat> we saw his star in the east his star now i find that interesting <clears throat> they said his star so this star that all of a sudden appear is his star that is jesus's star the young child's star and when you look at verse 7 and compare them verse 2 and 9, it shows that these wise men <clears throat> had seen a star <clears throat> in their own country and that they saw it again as they left Bethlehem. The fact that they were able to do so shows that it's no ordinary star, but it's a divine revelation of light which has moved ahead of them and guided them to the exact spot where the little boy would be staying. My brother-in-law years ago um, read an article about a <clears throat> star that uh, would rise <clears throat> every so often and they were professing that that was the star uh, that led the wise men to Jesus Christ. But not according to scripture, it's not a star that... that continues on to this day. This was a specific star that appeared and, and then guided them and then hovered over where Christ himself was. Some have thought maybe it was Jupiter and Saturn uh, that um, <clears throat> somehow shone light upon them. Others thought that there might have been a supernova that, that, that just took place and then somehow led them and then hovered over them. Again, these are, these are just thoughts. It's all subjective. We really don't know what's going on. Some have even suggested, which I kind of lean towards more, but I don't know. It could have been a celestial body. It could have been an angel assigned to him. We know Jesus. <clears throat> you remember when he was tempted by the devil? And the devil said, <clears throat> throw yourself down and the angels will pick you up. Remember that? You know, assigned angels to him. We all have angels assigned to us, the Bible says, from our youth that protect us. So could it be that Jesus had angels protecting him? Could it have been a celestial angel that was actually lighting the way to where Christ was? That makes more sense to me. It was a supernatural light, a celestial uh, being of some sort possibly, but we really don't know. We do know this, that this star appeared and then it led and it hovered over where this young child stood. So Matthew is apparently saying that in the same way that the star kept going ahead of them until it came to the place where the child laid, it stood. God does miracles. <clears throat> That's why he's God. He can do miracles. Uh, we might not understand them. That's what makes them miracles. Things that we don't understand. It doesn't make any sense when someone gets healed and the doctor goes, I don't understand. With all my education, with all my training, with all my experience, all I can say, a miracle. Who did it? What did it? I don't know. A miracle, though. I don't understand it. That's what makes miracles miracles. Now, we know <clears throat> that it's God because God has shed his grace and love upon all of us, and he's a God that can do miracles. And when the heart is right, when the time is right, and the opportunity to be glorified, I think that's when God does miracles. That's when he really does miracles. Yesterday was my... <clears throat> seventh granddaughter's birthday she turned three i said you're two right and she goes three go three three <laughs> really cute and i said can i sing happy birthday and she goes no not yet <laughs> she wants me to wait with wait until everybody else you know is, is there i had to leave because <coughs> my cough and everything was acting up um i heard she was looking for me afterwards poppy where's poppy she wouldn't start until i was found 
You know, that was neat. I, I really got touched by that. But as I was leaving, I was thinking about all the people were, that were in the, the home there. Uh, my, my family, my immediate family, my sons, and then their children. I was thinking of Virginia's family, uh, her sisters, and their children. And who they impacted. And a lot of the people that were there were all fruit from what God did in my life. And I was just blown away by that. Now, I don't think anyone else cares, but I care. Because it just shows you that God can use you. When the time is right, when you're ready, and when he gets glorified, that's when God decides to use you and do a miracle in your life. And so because he saved my soul, we saved my wife's soul, we saved my mother's soul, even my sister was there who were also saved, then saved my wife's sister's souls and then their children's souls. And it's just like, and you go, wow, Lord, you're so good. And I also thought, I don't want that to be over. I don't want that to be over. I, I want it to continue on. I'm not done yet. I don't want to be done yet. I want God to continue to do miracles before me. I don't want to go on in ministry, though, just doing ministry. I want to see him work. I want to see him perform a miracle. And in order for that to happen, we have to be on our faces. We have to be seeking him. We have to be desiring, Lord, let us be the right man. Let us be the right woman. Let this be the right time. Use us, Lord, for your glory, Lord. And I guarantee you, he will. And we have that opportunity if we get our minds focused on the thing that we should be focused on. And that is glorifying our Father no matter what we do. No matter what you do in life. As long as you are glorifying your Father in heaven, He will be glorified through you. Because He's a God that does miracles. So, so God does miracles. And so it came until it stood over where the young child uh, stood. <coughs> Verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Now, they took pleasure. Why? Because they knew this was where they would encounter the Messiah. So they see the star. Aha, uh -huh, there it is. Oh, great. It's leading us. Oh, wonderful. It stopped. Oh, no. Now we'll see the Messiah. It's like being a little kid and your mom and dad said, hey, we'll be in the zoo uh, real soon. How do we know? Well, we're driving. Are we almost there? Yes, we're almost there. I see the off-ramp. I see the word zoo. It's coming. And they get all excited because they know they all of a sudden see the animals. And so these guys are excited. There's joy. <clears throat> the NIV says they're overjoyed. Aha! Uh -huh. Oh boy, this is getting exciting. We're going to see the Messiah. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to see him. And so they were very joyful. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. Notice that he was a young child. Remember the picture here. We have these wise men, these magis or kings, and they're bringing Jesus gifts. Now, we all have seen that picture. Where have we seen that picture before? On a postcard or a Christmas card, right? And as they're presenting their gifts, who they're presenting the gifts to? to a baby that's in a little manger being rocked, right? With the little farm animals. Is that what Matthew is saying here? Uh -uh. He says, when they came into the house, they saw the young child with Mary and his mother. Now notice it was a house. It wasn't a manger. They weren't still in the barn. They were in someone's house in Bethlehem. And it was a young child, anywhere from six to two years of age. So they've been looking for quite a while, a couple of years. And so Jesus is not just in this little manger waiting. He may be crawling around on his hands and knees. He may be running around as they're entering in and as they see him. So it, it's, it's a long way from what we understand to be true. And that's why I said we need to be careful that we're not believing what someone else says. The scriptures are there. They have been written for us to read to study and to look at every single word, every little statement means something to us. I know that it gives off a different vibe than it does to see these kings presenting gifts to a baby. There's just something, ah, about that, right? You know, women go, ah, ooh, isn't, isn't that sweet? Oh, that's so wonderful. 
compared to kings presenting gifts to a two-year-old. Oh, what's he going to do with them? <laughs> you know, run around, throw them around, kick them around. That is a different picture, isn't it? That's a totally different picture. And it, it puts off a different vibe also. So these men obviously came in a different time. It was interesting. Uh, it, stick with me here, and hopefully I'm making sense here. <laughs> we, we ah and we ooh over things that move us emotionally. And that's okay, but that's not the facts. That's not objectively. Let me give you another example. When I was up at the youth conference last Sunday, <clears throat> I was sharing with the kids, and I, I asked permission before I did this because these kids are very impressionable. You're talking high schoolers down to 12-year-olds, and I don't want to make the wrong mistake. I don't want to present the wrong mistake <clears throat> as I share with them, but I, I did... Uh, I did this incorrectly. I, I met my wife at the age of 13, and then we had a child at the age of 15. And that's not the right way to do things. That's not the way you want to have your child do them. I asked them, I said, who's 13 here? And they raised their hands. I'm like, I go, I can't see you dating someone at that age. You look way too young. Who's 15? Can you imagine you having a little baby already rocking and taking? I go, I can't see that. And when I mentioned that I met her at 13, oh, you could hear all the girls, ah. And that we had a baby at 15, it's like, oh. And that we were still together after 30, you know, nine years, ah. And I'm like, no, no. See, we do the ah and the oh for the wrong things. Why? Because it's cute. It feels good. Oh, but that's so wrong, isn't it? Oh, they're presenting gifts to a baby. Wonderful gift card. Let's, let's print them. Let's sell them. People will enjoy them. They'll buy them. We'll make money. It's a lot better than presenting gifts to a two-year-old. Too many people know what a two-year-old will do. That don't sell. So is truth important? It is, isn't it? And that's why you can't go by what the secular world tells you. They don't read their Bible. <laughs> I'm sure that the original Christmas card may have been to a two-year-old and someone said, that ain't going to sell. Is there a possibility that that child was maybe six months? Yeah, okay, let's make him a baby then. Still in the crib, running, still milking. That will sell. We need to be careful that we're not listening to others, even listening to me. You know, I'm expounding on this and, and adding to it, and there's some possibilities to this, but stick to what the Word of God has said. It doesn't tell us, <clears throat> and so we can't say as fact. We only share what's here. They fell down, they found the child, they fell down, and they worshipped him. Now, notice they didn't worship Mary. They didn't worship <coughs> Joseph, <coughs> who they worship, the young child. They fell on their faces before this young child, a king the Messiah, the one that they've been looking for. There may be a reference to this that may give us a better understanding at what was taking place here. Because again, another one of the lies is when you see these Christmas cards, how many wise men do you see in the card usually? Three, right? Usually, it doesn't say. It doesn't tell us three. We don't know how many are there. Now we have an idea that there's more than three. If you were to write this down next, next to that scripture in your Bible, Isaiah 60, verse 6. <clears throat> this is an interesting scripture in the Old Testament prophesying about this event. <clears throat> he, said, he said, the multitude of camels shall cover your land. How did these wise men come? On camels. Isaiah saying there's going to be a multitude of camels, more than three. The dromedary, which is a single hump camel of medium, and those of Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. That could be a reference to what is going on here. So a multitude of camels. Well, three guys aren't going to bring a bunch of camels. What for? <clears throat> there were many others with him that came and they offered up the gold and incense before them. And so it seems that Matthew is, is agreeing with I, what Isaiah said in the past. So they opened up their treasuries. 
I got treasuries. <clears throat> What's a treasury? <laughs> Is it a box that carry these things? Yes, but where did that treasury come from? Uh, treasuries is, is wealth accumulated and kept primarily in a place and temple in the ancient worlds. And so it was uh, a designated place where, where you would have a treasury. And they had them in the temple. They had the treasuries there. Uh, for those that were Gentiles, they had treasuries there. For those that were men, uh, Jews, they had treasuries for the poor. They had treasuries for the priests. Different treasuries. Treasuries were <clears throat> acquired by royal conquest. You go in and you conquer an old nation, and we find that in First Kings chapter 14, and you would take their treasure, and then you would put it in your treasury. It could be acquired by trade or taxes. You'd conquer these nations. They become your subjects. You start taxing them, and their taxes goes to the treasuries or gifts. We've seen that in Kings also, where other nations come and give gifts to Solomon. Solomon takes it and puts it in his treasury or even tribute. A uh, monarch's treasury were used to adorn their palaces. They would take the treasury and whatever was in there, they would then uh, beautify their temples, beautify their cities. Uh, they would purchase military, um, build their defense and so forth with all of these treasuries. A lot of them would actually dedicate uh, some of this treasury and wealth to their deities. Uh, they would make offerings to their gods and so forth, adorn their temples interesting here are these men coming with their treasuries to adorn the messiah to give to him the gold the frankincense and the myrrh and christians still with their treasuries because we all have treasuries don't we we may put it in chase bank you may put it in your vault you may put it in your wallet. <laughs> you know, that's all the treasury I got. <laughs> you know, not much more than that. But we all have treasuries, and we still give from that treasury unto the Lord, don't we? We support His work. We're giving unto our Messiah. Illustration of how some don't do this. Paris government officials said in 1974 they had planned to strip churches of their treasured arts. Uh, there was a high rise in art theft. And they were finding that these thieves were going into churches that weren't secure. And they were stealing this valuable art. I'm talking masterpieces. And so they decided they were going to go in there and take it all and put it under lock and key under one guard so that nobody could take in any art whatsoever. And some Christians are like that. They put their treasuries under guard. This is only used for me is only used for us it's not for anyone else you know, treasury is not for us it's for god you know we talk a lot about tithing and i believe in tithing 10 percent of what god gives you your usable income but when you look at the new testament <clears throat> we find that there are scriptures that say everything is god's because god has given it unto us he's entrusted us as stewards of these things and so how we handle these things, God will judge us and will supply our needs accordingly. And that's why some of us are not as rich as he probably would like to make us because we're not as faithful with what he has given unto us. These men took of their treasuries, however they got their treasuries, and they brought it to Jesus. And we don't know how they used it because it doesn't say. It doesn't tell us that, that Mary and Joseph went out and bought new clothes, some brand new Nikes possibly they used it on their trip to Egypt because Herod was going to kill them and they knew that and the Lord directed them and moved them. So I'm sure they took some of the gold and possibly for traveling and so forth. <clears throat> the frankincense, we, we know, again, we don't really know, again, what they use these things for. Matthew doesn't say it all, so, so we're only guessing. But we know frankincense was a spice uh, gold is, is the wealth of a king. Jesus is a king. And so he's receiving gold as a symbol of his mighty shipness. Uh, we know that uh, frankincense was a, a luxury a spice that was brought in, a white resinous gum that came from one of the trees there in Arabia or India. It speaks of a priestly role. Uh, <clears throat> priestly role. Uh, and they would anoint them with this. And so again, possibly that Jesus had the spice to be anointed with. Uh, myrrh also, a resin 
from a tree, usually speaking of a sacrificial death, you would use the myrrh to embalm a body. So it could be that they saved this all the way until then. I don't see them saving it all the way. It doesn't say, but maybe they did save it until the very end. Uh, we know later on down the road in John chapter 19, the Nicodemus and um, <laughs> Joseph asked for his body. Uh, and they began to wrap it with the spices and strips of linen, according to the Jewish customs. And they had like 75 pounds uh, of the spices. That's a lot. And so I don't think the kings brought that much. And how would you haul that wherever you went? So, you know, what happened to it? We don't know. It doesn't say. We can only guess. But they were given uh, for them to use. Notice that the gifts were presented to Jesus and not to Mary and Joseph. That's important for us to understand. That when we give gifts, we don't, we don't give them to individuals. We're giving it unto God. <clears throat> it's the only way that you should give and support the work of God. If you're giving your gifts to the Lord because of an individual, then that's the incorrect way of doing it. You give it unto the Lord because you saved your soul and because you're appreciative of what he has done for you. No matter what it is, the uh, widow's uh, might is a great example. It can be as small as a penny, but you're doing it unto God, and God will bless that. And Jesus even said that widow will be remembered, and to this day we still talk about that widow. She gave, she gave everything, right, that she had. Jesus and the disciples were sitting in the temple, and they were watching. They were watching people giving. Here's Jesus now, the Messiah, and he's watching people how they give. And we make such a big fuss. Pastors shouldn't be talking about giving. Really? And there's that limiting the pastors and what they can say again. But you have Jesus sitting watching people as they're giving. Oh, look how they're giving. He told the disciples, look at, look at the religious leaders. Look at religious people and how they give. They give out of their abundance. Well, I've got $1,000 Say, so I'll give 100 bucks. Well, look at the other guy. He's got 10000 Well, I'll give 200 bucks. Wait a minute, does that make sense? He's got more, but yet he's still giving less in percentage than the one with a thousand. You see how they give? They give according to their own ways and how they feel. They don't give according to the word of God. And then look at that widow. She get, gave beyond what she had. She gave it all unto the Lord. And what did she have to do? She had nothing left. That's so unfair. That's not right. Why would Jesus do that to her? Why would Jesus expect her to do that? She didn't expect her. It came from her and her heart. But Jesus did provide for her. And she had to trust in him that he would provide for her. And I know that God is faithful to his children who give from their hearts. And so God would provide for this widow who gave everything that she had. See, true worshipers worship God face to face. Those who look to Jesus will see him. And those who truly see him will worship him. And those who truly worship him will give unto him because they know him. And so being divinely warned, verse 12, in a dream that they should not return to Herod, uh, directly warned not to go. So apparently these, these men had a dream. Now did, did all of them have a dream? Uh, was it one of them that had a dream? It doesn't say. <laughs> It could be that more than one had a dream that confirmed that, you know, we, we can't go back to this guy, Herod. Uh, God is warning us not to go back to this guy. And so we, we can't go to him. So they departed to their own country another way. Can you imagine Herod hearing about that? This, this little arrogant man hearing, where are those guys? They're gone. They went home. What? I mean, he probably got angry called in all his guys advisors and we'll see next week that he will literally go and wipe out all the children from six months to two years old because they don't know what age jesus was at this moment here <clears throat> matthew tells us no more about these wise men this is it we don't hear any more about them from this point on let me close we should never stop treasuring Jesus. <clears throat> he should be the focus of our hearts. Jesus, he should be the center of our lives. No matter what you're going through, no matter what struggles, no matter what pain, what suffering, when Christ is in the center, he promises 
to lead you and to guide you. He promises to do a work through you. He said that he is the author and finisher of your faith. And so he begun a good work in you and he's faithful to complete it. These are promises that he's given to you. And it's up to us to, by faith, appropriate those promises and remind him, not that he needs reminding, but say, Lord, I know you have a work for us. I know there, that you're not done. I know that there's more. And so, Lord, please give us the strength, give us the belief, and give us the faith to continue to go forward, Lord. When a person treasures Jesus, then they know that they have something to draw from through in pain and through in suffering. When no one else understands, when no one else can, can sympathize with you, you can know that he knows what you're going through. And that can get you through many, many things. We are to seek him, not just here on Sunday morning, but every day of our lives, thinking about him, praying to him, asking, seeking, knocking, asking for the wisdom for the day, asking for the strength to do what's right, to be light in this world. We are to worship and adore him and we are to support his work. If you don't know Jesus as your personal savior, he wants to know you. He wants to come into your heart and be your Lord and your king. And he doesn't want to just leave you where you're at, but he wants to give you a new life, a life of joy, overjoyed, when you're in the presence of him. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Lord, I'm not sure where everyone is this morning. I'm not sure if everyone here knows Jesus, Lord. You know. You know their hearts. <clears throat> you know their lives. You know from the time that they were born until this day, Lord, that they would be here this morning. And Lord, the Bible's clear that all we have to do is confess Jesus as Lord and Savior to acknowledge his work upon the cross, that it was enough, it was sufficient, that God himself became the lamb who would die for our sins. That we'd acknowledge that and say, I don't understand it. I don't know how that works. But somehow spiritually and divinely, it is sufficient. It is enough for God to receive us into heaven. And so I accept it. And I appropriate it as my own, that he came for me and me alone. And the Bible says if we confess him with our mouths, if we simply say, Lord, come into my life and be my king, because I accept you as my king and as my deliverer, my savior, and fill me with your Holy Spirit that I may have eternal life. I give you glory. And as the Spirit of God is awakening the spirit that has been dead, so let, let the joy of the Lord begin to fill the life, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.